Good afternoon. I'd like to start and have you ponder a few headlines. In 2016, Japan is going to have their subway system fully automated. In 2021, Korea is going to come out with the first fully uh, flying cars that are commercially viable. We go to 2032, and Finland has become the world leader in clean and free and renewable energy. And further on, in 2044, Estonia, Estonia is going to be the first to establish a colony on Mars. Okay? Think about these. We'll get back to these in a little bit. What I'd like you to kind of join me on a journey here for is to talk about a problem that we are faced with, and more importantly, to discuss a solution, or at least one of many solutions. In the 1950s, our nation faced a major problem. Our children were not reading as good as the rest of the world. Okay, a landmark book came out called Why Johnny Can't Read, and you see in the subtext at the bottom, and maybe it should be in bigger print, and what we can do about it. Okay, what was happening is children were being taught to sight read. In other words, they were told to memorize words. And the problem with that was when they would come to a new word they had never seen before, they didn't have the skills to know how to do something about that new word they'd never seen. It was not a sight word to them. Okay? So what Rudolf Flesch's proposal was is we needed to get back to phonics. The rest of the world was still doing that. They were doing better at teaching their children how to read than we were. Okay? So I want to borrow that theme and update it for the current problem, which is we have children who can't do math or science. Actually, I want to modify that even a little bit further and say it's not just can't, and maybe more importantly, it's won't. They're choosing not to. And I want to not necessarily just cross out Johnny here, but I want to make sure Joni's included. So the title of my presentation today is Why Joni Can't and Won't Do Math or Science. Okay, and very importantly, and what you can do about it. What you can do about it. I'd like you to listen to what our president articulates when he talks about our past, present, and future, and how all of that has been intertwined and related to technology and our achievements in those areas. And now it's our turn. We know what it takes to compete for the jobs and industries of our time. We need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. The first step in winning the future is encouraging American innovation. None of us can predict with certainty what the next big industry will be or where the new jobs will come from. Thirty years ago, we couldn't know that something called the Internet would lead to an economic revolution. What we can do, what America does better than anyone else, is spark the creativity and imagination of our people. We're the nation that put cars in driveways and computers in offices, the nation of Edison and the Wright brothers, of Google and Facebook. In America, innovation doesn't just change our lives, it is how we make our living. Our free enterprise system is what drives innovation. Okay. I'm not, ask, I'm not asking you if you're a Democrat. I'm not asking if you're a Republican. I'm not asking you if you voted for President Obama. What I am asking you is, do you agree with what he has to say here in his 2011 State of the Union address? Have we got, in, in large part, where we are because of our innovation and technology? Okay. I strongly believe that, and I, and I see a lot of heads nodding in the audience. Okay. We are, unfortunately, faced with a situation where that may not continue if we don't take steps really soon. But where is that issue coming in? Let's talk about the universities and the colleges in our nation. And it turns out we've got really good ones, okay? The world looks to us as the leaders in higher education, and that still continues to be true. In a recent, actually from 2010, a ranking of the 400 top universities in the world, uh, the United States has 12 of those 16. Moving down more locally, we can see in Illinois alone, we've got five of them local to us. We are really blessed to have a higher education system that is going to prepare us for that future. So that's not where the issue is, okay? Within specific disciplines, what I call STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, we are in the top six or, you know, we have six or seven of the top ten institutions in the world in all of these areas. We are ready for those innovative thinkers 
those people who are ready to take us those next technology steps. But here's where the problem comes in. And that is when we start first looking at the proportion of our students who go into those areas in college and do they finish it. And the answer, unfortunately and sadly, is no. We have a lot of students who don't go all the way to completion in those areas when they go to these great finer uh, institutions of higher learning. We also are starting to fall way behind in our high schools, in our K through 12 system. As a matter of fact, it's very scary to note our ranking, not just on one measure, but on a lot of different uh, surveys that are coming out showing, uh, and one example here is the Program for International Student Assessment, the PISA. The rankings from last year show that we came in out of 65 countries who had their graduating high school seniors take this assessment. We came in 32nd. Do you remember those fictional headlines at the beginning? Number one, Korea. Number two, Finland. Number five, Japan. Number 13, Estonia. Number 32, United States. Okay, We are dropping. And it's not, as I said, this is just one example of many that are showing that our students are not being prepared to go on in those science, technology, engineering, and math areas. They are not ready for it. So what can we do? Okay, it sounds like we agree that this is an issue. We, we feel that we are a nation that's built on innovation. We've got to have the people who can come in and, and be that next generation and the generation after that who continue to move us in that direction. There are a lot of thinkers and a lot of uh, very important committees that have been formed and panels of experts. Uh, they come back with all kinds of recommendations, some of which I list here. Uh, create rigorous standards and curriculum. Uh, make sure that we recruit great teachers and so on. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's not an answer. Though obviously, we need to make a lot of steps like that. But does that some, sound like something that's going to fix the problem tomorrow? No. And, but that doesn't mean abandon it. But I want to make this personal. I want to make this local. What can we do now? Okay. Yes, we need to take those steps. But we need to do something now. Seriously, what can we do now? Okay. This is my family. My wife and I are our two experimental subjects that were mentioned earlier. Okay. Lexi and Kyle. Okay. For me, it's real personal. For a lot of you, whether you've got children, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, it's, you know, I care about them. I care about making sure they're ready for tomorrow. I don't care if they're going to be a scientist or an engineer, but I do care that they are interested in and can function in a technical society. Okay, we need to make sure that our children of today and tomorrow and the next tomorrow are ready for this stuff and are ready to compete with the rest of the world. So I want to give you, a, before I move into the solution and, and what I'm passionate about and I'm bringing to you today, I talk just a tiny bit about the underpinnings from an educational perspective. Two notions called constructivism and constructionism. Basically, the notion of constructivism is that we learn and we, we retain things and we understand our world by building models in our head. Okay, we, we kind of develop these mental images, mental models of, of how things work. Constructionism takes that one step further, and, and Jean Piaget uh, was, was a pioneer in that area. One of his protégés, Seymour Papert, pictured on the right up here, uh, took that one step further and said that not only do people learn that way and understand that way, but they do even better if instead of just doing it in their head, if they're doing it with their hands and if they're working on physical models or virtual models in a computer. Okay? Really let people and kids, very importantly, play with these very major ideas. Dr. Pappert's work has spurred a lot of tools, many of which are free, that we can use to do exactly that. Okay? These are just some images of several of these. Uh, that are available to us. The ability for children to easily make their own games. Okay, uh, Down in the lower right hand, left hand corner, uh, being able to do arts and crafts projects that have motors and sensors and, and what have you. Uh, the point being, get them to have fun with this stuff. Okay, A byproduct of that is they're going to be exposed to math and science and engineering and technology. That doesn't have to be the emphasis. Okay, Let them have fun and let them get passionate about it. And let's watch a little bit of that passion. I like working in Squeak a lot. It's very fun. It makes math funner. This is a project where we got two cars and we would race them. 
to the finish line and we'd have a small timer and we had to do a color test to make them go. If green car sees black, then he has to go forward by zero, which would be stopping. Once one of the cars got to the finish line, then the other car had to stop. I wouldn't say I really love math, but Squeak makes me really like math a lot. Because you put math in a different way and it can be fun. Math can be fun? Is that really a 10-year-old speaking there? Let's also look at uh, some Girl Scouts who are doing some inventing. Yeah, see? It just beeps. Christina Costa is trying to build a better mouse trap. Make that gerbil trap. Every time they want to go inside this gerbil house, they press this light sensor. It's one of the many inventions created at this free math and science camp run by the Computer Museum and the Girl Scouts, where girls from Boston are devising everything from an odometer for roller blades to a diary security system. When someone touches this to try to open the diary, it'll take a picture of that person. So like if your creepy little brother tries to read your diary? Yeah. He's on camera. Yes, yes. So we found what motivates her, her creepy little brother, okay? doesn't matter what motivates her. We need to tap into that. We need to make sure that she's having fun. President Obama, another quick uh, comment from him uh, from his 2011 State of the Union address kind of taps into this fun aspect and this celebration aspect. That responsibility begins not in our classrooms, but in our homes and communities. It's family that first instills the love of learning in a child. Only parents can make sure the TV is turned off and homework gets done. We need to teach our kids that it's not just the winner of the Super Bowl who deserves to be celebrated, but the winner of the science fair. Okay. First Lego League is exactly that. It's an organization it's founded with uh, Legos as its core product. Once again, that's something that come out of the constructionism theories. Um, and you notice on here it says sport for the mind. What I have done and what First Lego League does, uh, which, which led me down this path, is they give students challenges, okay, that you can see on the table over here. I'm going to go over and show you a couple in a minute. A four-foot by eight-foot mat with ten different challenges that they need to solve. There's not one answer. It's not like school. We don't sit there and do equations. They have a problem sitting there to solve, and it's interesting some of the realistic problems that they're forced to solve when they get into this. Real quick, I want to give you a little bit of sense of what it looks like when a robot is doing some of these challenges. Keeping in mind the students have to build the robot themselves, program it. Once they release it, they have to let it go. It has to, the robot has to go do what it has to and come back.
Okay. That's just a real short intro to some of these things that I'm going to show you here in a moment. At Moraine Valley, we're offering courses like this. I'm not trying to get you to come here. I'm not trying to send, get you to send your children here, your brothers and sisters, although that would be great. But I want you to be aware that there are ways that we can get these kids to really get excited about stuff. One of my favorite stories is I had a group of 6th uh, and 7th graders in one Saturday. They were, working, they were doing work for the first Lego League team that they were on. They came at 10 in the morning and they left at 4. I told them bring their, their sack lunch. And would you believe when they left, three of them had not touched their lunch. When I was cleaning the lab, their lunches were sitting there. Do you know many 6th and 7th graders who are going to not eat because they are having so much fun for six hours doing what they're doing? That's what happened, though. Okay? So some of these things that, uh, you know, and, and I like our tagline here, which is where play is serious fun, because this is a serious thing that we need to address here, but it can be fun. So at Moraine Valley, what we do is we have a wide variety of courses, and we start with a theme. What are students interested in? And that's kind of what uh, First Lego League, they do similar. They go out and address some current important topics right now. And it may seem like, well, they're just Legos. Well, the students, the first two days they're there, I teach them how to build this robot, and I teach them how to program it, okay, how to drive forward, how to turn, how to use the sensors, and what have you. But then the last two days are the really, really cool part. They're with a partner, and they work on that four-foot by eight-foot mat that I mentioned. They've got a lot of challenges. They get to pick which one they want to focus on, and they pick what strategy they want to do. They pick how they want to build it. They can tear that apart and redo it however they need to. So they might have something like there's a cargo container out there. And, you know, there's a challenge in this. You know, they need to go get the, the cargo container that's fallen off of a ship. Well, this is really heavy for that robot to bring back. They may need to go out to a crater on Mars and get some ice core samples. Well, you have that robot drive over that crater, and it's going to knock it off course. They need to figure out how to make that robot know how to come back on its own. You know, and I could go through this whole table. There's challenge after challenge after challenge of ways that you can get kids to, you don't even talk to them about math. You don't talk about science. You don't talk about te technology. But it's there. It's, it's constantly present. And you've got so many teachable moments, it's not even funny. So we see an example of a mat with a bunch of missions set up. Look at the pictures here. We've got students who are all very intense and intent on what they are doing. Okay? That's the sort of engagement we want. And that's something we can achieve right now. We don't have to wait for the longer-term solutions that we hope will be coming. We can start addressing this right now. On the prior slide, it said, if you win their hearts, their minds will follow. I strongly believe that. And the thought I want to leave you with today is, please, when you're working with children, when you have children, when you have any association with children, make sure that you understand their passion, support their passion, do what you can, but also, very importantly, know that you can be the one to ignite a passion for them. That can last a lifetime for them. Thank you.